all set up there, Alan? I think so. Okay. This is the day the Lord has made, so let's rejoice and be glad in it as we worship our Savior this morning with uh, a different type of service, creative worship, something we've done here, you know, once a month. And so I don't know, really need to explain a whole lot other than like confession, absolution, and the preface. Uh, there will be a little difference, so be sure to watch for them. Um, it is printed in the bulletin, but of course will be up on our screen for everything to follow along with. And again, the prayers, as we've done during the service, is a responsory where I'll say the first petition. So actually, I'll introduce the prayers, and then I'll say the beginning uh, petition to the prayer, and then you all conclude the petition of those prayers. So we go back and forth during the prayers, so be sure to watch for that. Uh, when we get to that. Um, I thought there was something else I had to make note of. We have three, a lot of hymns today are familiar, except for our, our one communion hymn. Um, again, it's chosen. Um, it's not one we've sung a whole lot, but I, we may have sung it in the past. Um, but it has to do with our readings and our theme for this week. That's why it was chosen. Um, but that one, the sermon hymn, and the uh, closing hymn are all doxology hymns. So we stand for the final verse, the doxology verse, the reverence to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we always conclude that with the amen. Yes, yes, Lord, let this be so about you, our holy triune God, and all that you do for us. So this morning, we're going to get a lot of exercise standing and sitting a lot this morning. So we're going to make sure you're all awake and alive this morning here. <laughs> So again, we'll, when they come up, again, we see the triangle on the screen and conclude the amen, and, and then I'll tell us to rise as well. Um, this morning also, the, um, we're going to sing Lamb of God. Again, we have permission to use that song, so we will be singing that uh, right before communion is, again. And then uh, the Kyrie, as, uh, this is the Kyrie that Alan had created for us. You guys sang it during Holy Trinity Sunday with Pastor Randy. And we're going to sing it again. We're going to use that one for creative worship when we do that once a month. And it's wonderful. Alan created that for us, and we're able to sing it. So uh, we look forward to uh, singing that one uh, this morning. As the Lord has blessed you, feel f and you move by the Spirit, please place your offering in the basket on the way out. And we've gone back to some of our no more communion practices, where now we come up for the full railing. Um, we could probably put the middle section together, probably, I think. And so then everyone can come up together and... Uh, and then I'll come through with the wafer, and then I'll come through with the individual cups, and then you can, I'll place the wafer in your hands, and then you can grab the individual cup from the, from the trays now. Um, if you, if you uh, oops, excuse me, if you don't feel quite comfortable with that yet, please let me know or let one of the ushers know to come tell me, and I can bring communion back to the pew for you. Um, or if you want to wait for the spacing in there, I understand, so by all means. Uh, we want to make people feel as comfortable as you can to receive the Lord's Supper. We're not hindering people from the Lord's Supper, so we want to make sure, but with, with all restrictions being lifted and, and um, numbers no, haven't been in our county for a while now, um, we can come back to some of those safe practices like they actually the other two churches have been going back to as well this morning. So again, y'all, everyone come up. We'll come up together as one big table, one big fellowship like we used to have before COVID um, all together um, with all that. So we begin praising our Lord this morning with our opening hymn, We Give Thee But I Know.
We rise as you're able to do so. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Since it is our intention to receive the Lord's Supper, we ought to examine ourselves, acknowledging our guilt, and repenting of our sins, believing that in the sacrament, God grants us undeserved, total forgiveness, and account of the life, death, and the resurrection of his Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. So let us, before God and one another, confess our sins. We have failed you, O Father, turning from your holy and righteous face. At times, we are dispassionate about being your disciples. Our thoughts are not Christ-like. Our actions are aligned with evil rather than with good. The words we speak are damaging, not uplifting. Cleanse us this day, Father, with your forgiveness. May we be thoroughly covered in the righteousness of your dear Son. Our Heavenly Father is gracious and compassionate with repentant sinners. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer the punishment we deserved. Therefore, as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce God's grace, pure gift unto all of you. And I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen, we are forgiven. Now we join in singing uh, the Kyrie by Alan.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, during his earthly ministry, your son Jesus healed the sick and raised the dead. By the healing medicine of the word and sacraments, pour into our hearts such love toward you that we may live eternally. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. The Old Testament reading for the fifth Sunday after Pentecost is from Lamentations chapter 3. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth. Let him sit alone in silence when it is laid on him. Let him put his mouth in the dust. There may yet be hope. Let him give his cheek to the one who strikes. Let him be filled with insults. For the Lord will not cast off forever. But though he cause grief, he will have compassion, according to the abundance of his steadfast love. For he does not willingly afflict or grieve the children of men. This is the word of our Lord. The epistle for this morning is from 2 Corinthians chapter 8, where Paul calls on Christians to excel in the grace of giving and so mirror the giving love that God has shown to us. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty had overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means, of their own free will, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then by the will of God to us. Accordingly, we urge Titus that as he had started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you, See that you excel in this act of grace also. I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love also is genuine. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that by you his poverty might become rich. I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but that as a matter of fairness, your abundance at the present time should supply their need so that their abundance may supply your need, and that there may be fairness. As it is written, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. We rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the fifth chapter. Jesus heals and raises the dead and shows to be the Lord of life and death. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so that she may be well and live. And he went with him. A great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for twelve years, and who had suffered much under many physicians, and spent all that she had, and was no better, but rather grew worse. And she had heard the reports about Jesus, and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, If I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. 
Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why are you making commotion and weeping? The child is not dead but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. And taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talithia kumai, which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this, and told them to give her something to eat. This is the gospel of our Lord. Now, as the Lord has also told us to not fear and only believe, we confess our belief what is with our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, and the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. I invite our children forward for a children's message. Good morning, girls. Good morning, everyone else. You girls know what these are, don't you? Yeah, you got to play with this yesterday, huh? <laughs> Does Daddy let you play with these ones? No. <laughs> For those who can't see it out there, this is a smaller version. My little tractors that uh, I have a big collection of them. Right, honey? <laughs> I would love to set them all up and do a whole big farming thing. And uh, I just don't have room in the house for them at all. Because <laughs> I got lots of these, but you're right, girls. I don't let you play with these, and why don't, doesn't let Daddy play with you? Play with these. Yeah, you chew on them, and you break them, and, and this is one of Daddy's big hobbies is collecting these little guys. So, yeah, I don't like to share these ones, but what did you girls do yesterday? You played with my big tractors, yes. When we went down to Wisconsin, we were able to bring the, the big tractors back up so you girls can play with them. And so you girls did get to play with them yesterday, right? And there's a few more we got to get up. All this morning got to play with them too, huh? Yeah. And yesterday when you were playing them, you weren't quite playing them with actual farming, but that's okay. You were still playing with them. Daddy got to share them with you, and you had fun with them, right? Yeah. You girls always like to share? <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> you girls sometimes have trouble sharing, right? Just like Daddy doesn't really want to share his little tractors with you because I don't want them broken. These ones are a little harder to fix. The bigger ones, they're a little harder to break, aren't they? 
They're a little more durable. But sharing is nice, because look at all the fun you girls had yesterday playing with the big tractors and, and all the other fun. And we got a real life tractor to ride in too, don't we? You girls like riding in that one too? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but sharing is fun. But you know, there's something more important than just sharing tractors and our toys and everything else, right? And that's sharing the good news of? Jesus. That's right, Felicity. Thank you. Yeah, it's fun to share with our toys. And look at that. He gets that fun already here. But we have more fun. <laughs> but there's more fun we get to do. And that's sharing the good news of Jesus. Did you girls have fun at VBS a few weeks ago? Yeah, that was lots of fun. And we're going to do the same VBS at Jungle here at Trinity with Bethlehem in about a month. Um, and we look forward to that because it was lots of fun. You got to do fun crafts, fun activities, fun games, all oh, the snacks. Oh, yeah, there were lots of snacks, weren't there? But more than that, you had fun learning about Jesus. And with that, we got to tell other people about all the fun we had. Yeah, all the fun stuff we got to do, but the funness of Jesus and what he did for us. And that's exciting news to share with everybody, right? You know, Daddy was quite excited to share his tractors. And yes, I do have Barbie dolls because I had two sisters, so I played Barbies. So we got you girls play with the Barbies too, and Mama's Barbies as well. So we share this stuff when we have fun. How much more fun do you think we could have if we share Jesus with everybody? More. more fun. I think so too. Fun in VBS, fun in Sunday school, fun. I mean, I seem like it, but fun in church. Daddy has fun in church. Yeah. We get to sing and Bible school, and a whole bunch of other stuff. We get that fun because Jesus makes it fun for us in everything he does because he makes us want to share about him with others. So with that, why don't we join in uh, praying together? Remember, we do an echo prayer where I say the first part of the prayer, and you repeat after me, and we include all the big kids in this too out there. So everyone repeat after me. Dear Jesus, Jesus. we thank you, thank you for giving us joy and fun. Help us to share all about you and your fun. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, girls, you can go back to your seats. Oh, I know. And although I said we're good, we should share, I'm still not going to share my little tractors, okay, girls? Because <laughs> we share more about Jesus. We all join in singing. Our uh, next hymn now, Gracious God, You Send Great Blessings.
Grace, mercy, and peace be to all from God our Father, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and our helper, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lesson for consideration this morning comes from our continuation in the book of 2 Corinthians, now in the 8th. on my mic and it was literally just died. <laughs> I had to change the batteries there. In the name of our Savior Jesus Christ, dear people of God, no, we're not going to talk about John Deere tractors this morning because we're going to go back to a time period when there were no tractors and no such thing as John Deere. We're going to go back to Jerusalem, the Jewish capital, the birthplace of the New Testament Christian church on Pentecost. In Apostle, Apostle Paul's day, though many Christians in Jerusalem struggle, if you go to Jerusalem right now, you will find that there is less than 3% of Christians left in the city where Christianity started. So going back to Paul's day, people who followed Jesus instead of the Jewish leaders, crosses and burdens were brought upon them. The help and aid that was there for widows and the poor was now cut off from the Jewish relief funds because it appears <clears throat> they, were, <clears throat> excuse me, they were following Jesus, so they got cut off. At first, it didn't seem too bad. There was a lot of wealthy Jews who became Christians, and so in brotherly love, they shared what they had. Widows were provided for. The poor was taken care of. <clears throat> but persecution not only scattered the Christians, it also seems to have taken away whatever wealth that was among them in Jerusalem. So even when the persecution died down of Christians, the Christians there struggled to survive and to thrive, especially in times when famine and other crises came up. So Paul gathered a collection for them among the Gentiles, churches in Galatia, in northern Greece called Macedonia, and in southern Greece where Corinth was. And just as the gospel had gone out from Jerusalem with Paul, to all these Gentile places, making them now spiritually rich in Jesus Christ. So now these Gentile churches were responding and sharing their wealth to help their fellow saints in Jerusalem. Excuse me a second. <clears throat> so the, <clears throat> excuse me. the Christians in Corinth had this great idea. Why don't we start beginning to contribute and help these people out? And they were among the first... Uh, about a year ago from when Paul wrote this letter to actually start desiring to do so. But then problems started coming up that kept them from fully putting this, this desire into practice. Divisions toward a congregation. Christians were suing other Christians in court. Open sins were boasted about. The Lord's Supper had generated the selfish feast that people came to. And there were more problems that arose. That's what Paul was writing his first letter to these Corinthians, addressing these problems. And the people took these words to heart and changed their mindsets. But in the meantime, the gathering that they were looking at doing and providing for others had fallen off. <clears throat> so now in 2 Corinthians, Paul is writing to them again. And in chapters 8 and 9, he urges them to give their attention back to this offering and participating that they were looking at doing. Now, he's not using the latest marketing techniques, and he's not using psychology and all the social science in a way to try to attract as many people to give as possible. Oh, no. Rather, he uses one thing, one thing alone, and it's all that mattered. God's grace. God's grace at work in the church of Macedonia that overflowed in their giving. God's grace in Jesus Christ that enriched the Corinthian Christians. God's grace is for all people, of all times, of all places. And that's as true today as it was in the day of Paul. Our faith speaks out God's grace. Our faith boldly proclaims God's grace. And Christian faith, our faith, overflows from God's grace. So give yourself to your gracious God. And trust his grace with an undivided heart. Then our faith will indeed overflow from God's grace. Paul starts talking about the Macedonian churches. He says, all of the most severe trial that they were going through, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. 
The Macedonian churches would have included churches in Philippi and Thessalonica. And I don't know if you remember what happened to Paul in those cities. When Philippi, he and Silas were beaten and jailed for driving a demon out of a slave girl that was used to make money for her owners. And then Thessalonica, the believers had to sneak Paul out of a window on the wall at night because earlier that day, a mob rounded up by the Jews was seeking Paul at the place that he was staying at. And such hardship and persecution continued against the Christians. Well, was that their severe trial? And when Paul refers to their extreme, down in the depths of poverty, remember who's talking here and writing this. Paul knows what it means to be poor. He's not talking about simply seeing your retirement account shrink or your investment going bad. He's not talking about struggling to make payments on another vehicle or even wondering how you make the next rent or mortgage payments. Oh no, he's talking about real poverty where you have nothing, not even a penny to your name. Because Paul knows firsthand what it means to be poor. As far as we know, he actually had no permanent home that he could go to at night and lay down in a nice, warm, comfy bed. Most of what he had, he probably kept with him as he traveled all over the Middle East and Europe. He had known hunger, toil, imprisonment, sickness, coldness. And yet he's the one who's referring to the Macedonian church as poor. How deep their poverty must have been that poor Paul is referring to them as poor. And yet, out of the depths of their poverty, they asked, or we could say they insisted, to be allowed to contribute to the collection for the saints in Jerusalem. Oh, they could have argued that they needed the help. They could have thought that, oh, no, we need to be the recipients. We need to be given this stuff because look how bad we are. But instead, entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded for the privilege of sharing in the service of the saints. And they gave as much as they were able to and even beyond their ability. Well, what was the secret to their sharing? Why did they so willingly, joyfully, cheerfully participate with the saints in Jerusalem, even though they themselves were suffering probably far worse? The answer shines out in the apostles' words. They gave themselves first to the Lord. And that is the key. Before anything is planned, before anything is said, before anything is done, Give yourself, yes, your whole self, to the Lord. For you see, he first gave himself to us. He didn't need to, but he did all love for us. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that through his poverty you might become rich. What grace of our loving God. He, who is God over all, who created the whole cosmos, the eternal, almighty, glorious Son of the Father. What riches and bounty and honor and glory belonged to him as he was up in heaven. Came to our earth, took on our pity selves. More specifically, took on our debt to sin. He took on your poverty. Why? Because he loved you so much that he wanted to share his heavenly riches with you all. He didn't want to leave you poor, miserable sinners. He wanted to make you rich in his holy name. What grace of our loving God. That's the grace from which our faith overflows. Why would we not surrender our very selves to our gracious Lord, who has loved us so dearly, that he came to suffer punishment on the cross for us. He came to die for our debt, to make us rich in God and toward God. And if we are giving our very selves to the Lord, why would then we withhold our faith? Who has given us our faith and proclaiming our faith. And what does it mean to give yourself to the Lord? Well, the word it means to trust him completely. Trust his grace with an undivided heart. 
Trust him with single-minded devotion. Trust him without the disloyalty, without an angle that says, oh, Lord, if I trust in you more, then you're going to do all this goodness for me. But rather trust him with some simplicity that says, Lord, I don't need to know how I'm going to make it through next week. I don't need to know what earthly benefits or blessings you're going to give to me. I don't need to know how it's all going to work out. I don't need to know, Lord, because I trust in you. And his grace, his promises will not fail you. They never have, and they never will. For he has already given of himself for you. And if he gave up all of himself to come here and win salvation for you, how much more will he not bless us and take care of us in all things? What grace. But our faith does suffer. It suffers because of us, because of our disloyalty, because of our doubleness that still divides our heart from completely trusting in him. Oh, we trust the Lord, but we also trust the comforts of our earthly things. Oh, we trust the Lord, but we also trust our skills and our hard work to get us through what we need to get through. Oh, we trust the Lord, but we trust our wealth to get us. We trust the resources to help us along. We trust our government to do everything for us. We trust ourselves over the Lord. Do you see that this loyalty that divides our hearts now from the Lord? It's a betrayal of our Lord in exchange for earthly pleasures and security. For instead of fully trusting His grace, we have divided loyalties. So confess, dear Christians, confess with me. For your Lord is gracious. He has already paid the debt of your sinful disloyalty, the debt of all your sins. He became poor to make you rich. See, my soul, your Savior chooses, poverty and weaknesses too. In such love, he comes to you. Neither crib nor cross he refuses, but all he suffers for your good, to redeem you and make you rich in his holy blood. What grace. His grace moves us to confess our disloyalty and seek his forgiveness. And I do need to confess. I need to apologize for the way I started worship last week. I did not mean to chide or condemn anybody on my words that I said, but rather I, I just wanted people to focus on the grace of Jesus Christ. And that Ellen and I get done with worship at Grace and plenty of time to get here. It's other things that keep us and, and need our attention at that church before we can leave. And so that's what kind of makes us to be late sometimes. And so I don't want people, let me rephrase that. I don't mind that people get upset that we're late. I completely understand. What upsets me is when people start saying that then grace, God's grace, needs to be cut down for the peace people at grace. Instead, we have to look back at the Macedonian church, that they gave up everything that they had because they knew of God's grace. And so as we work together, either as a single ministry or a tri-parish ministry, the goal in all of this is God's grace. Not taking God's grace away from people, but rather supplying and supporting God's grace and his work in all things. So that's what we need to focus on going ahead no matter what it is. Because such grace moves us to trust in him. It moves us to do things and work together with our Lord for other people. It allows us to trust in him with all you have, with all you are, with your very selves. Because that's what we saw in the Macedonian churches. As they gave despite their heavy trials and their deep poverty. They trusted their Lord and they trusted his grace because they knew his grace would not fail them no matter what trials or tribulations they went through or how much money or whatever they had. Their faithfulness overflowed from God's grace that was shown to them from all the missionaries that came from Jerusalem. Consider the story of a boy who was catching fish for a supper. He wanted to give some to the Lord. 
So he brought a fish to the pastor. And the pastor asked him, well, where's the other fish for you, you to eat? The little boy answered, well, they're still in the lake waiting for me to catch them. What trust in the Lord? Or a personal story from us. We had the, Kayla and I, we got married, we're on Vicarage, and during that time we found out we were expecting Felicity. Well, within a few months, we had to move back down to St. Louis to finish my last year of schooling so I could become a pastor and actually become your guys' pastor. The thing is, we're going to be moving back to St. Louis, knowing we were pregnant, knowing that I had a full year of school, neither one of us had a full-time job, and we had no place to live. You know what everyone else would say? Don't go back. Stay home. Stay with your family. You know you have someone there for you. Um, Caitlin had a full-time job. We're there, so she had a good full-time job with three hospitals. I know I would have been able to find a full-time job working. My dad's an electrician, so I probably could have worked for him. You know, we would have been taken care of. But the thing is, we trusted in the Lord completely, knowing that he would handle this no matter what happened. Yeah, we were scared and afraid at first, but we still trusted. You know what happened? We had a place to live for nine months. That wasn't the best. But we still had a place. Felicity was born six weeks early, but you know what? The Lord was still with her. Because look at her now, and you never know if she was born that early. And even there, people at the hospital said she was a mighty mouse, coming home after two weeks and not even really need, she didn't need any tubes or, or feeding or anything. And we know that the hospital bill was going to be extensive. It didn't matter to us. We trusted in the Lord to take care of it, and he did. Because had we not gone back and finished that last year, I want to become a pastor, which means I want to be your pastor, and I would not be up here right now. Who knows what the Lord would have did? But the Lord knew what he was doing, and all we had to do was trust in his plan, and look where we are at now. Six years living up here, and the possibility of a tri-parish down the future here. So trust your Lord. He will provide and take care of you. Trust his grace with an undivided heart. That's what comes first before anything else. First, trust his grace, giving yourself, your whole self, your whole being to the Lord. And then the whole way we look at our faith actually changes. We begin to see that the opportunity to speak out is, in fact, a gift from God's grace. Our faith is a gift, not a gift of ourselves, but a gift given to us from God through the Holy Spirit. And as you put your faith into practice, God is giving to you. Now, I'm not talking about, uh, oh, some blessings down the road. Oh, no, the very fact that you have opportunity this morning to hear God's word and receive a sacrament, that opportunity by itself is a gift from God's grace. And that's the grace God gave the Macedonian churches. They had the opportunity to participate and share with the saints in Jerusalem, to celebrate the fellowship that they shared in Jesus Christ, to rejoice in the gospel that had come to them from the very beginning of that church in Jerusalem. So don't miss out on these gifts, this opportunity the Lord has, has given us to celebrate the fellowship we share in his word as we support the true teaching and preaching of his word. What a gift it is to have the opportunities to confess and share our faith. What grace God has shown us by giving us these opportunities. So our giving overflows from God's grace. So dear friends, drink in God's grace. Hear the good news of Jesus Christ. He became poor paying our debt of sin to bring us his rich forgiveness and salvation. Take heart of all the goodness and kindness the Father is doing to all of us in many different ways. Trust him to take care of you. For filled with God's grace, we give ourselves to the Lord, trusting his grace with an undivided heart. Then our faith will continue to speak out, continue to share, for it overflows from his grace. Amen. Now may the peace of God, our Father, which guards our hearts and minds in our Savior, Jesus Christ, fill you with the Holy Spirit, as you too share your faith with others because of his grace. Amen. We rise now as we, whew, we, rise now as we join in the prayers of God's holy church.
Uh, in repetition form again, I'll, I'll introduce the prayers and then we get into the petitions. Heavenly Father, hear the prayers of your people for this day, for St. John's Lutheran Church of Burr Oak, for our nation and those who serve, those who need healing, those celebrating birthdays and anniversaries, those coming to the Lord's table, granting to us all things according to your word and promise. Holy Father, from whom our help comes, we have brought, you have brought us into your holy Christian church and made Christ our shield from every enemy. O Lord, you have shown to your church the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, who for our sakes became poor that by his poverty we might become rich. Bless St. John's Lutheran Church of Burr Oak, its mission and its people, its leaders, and its pastor. Almighty God, be with the governing authorities and enable them to preserve peace and order in our nation. Hear our prayers for our leaders, for our military and police, and other civil servants. O oh Lord, you did not turn aside the bold request of Jairus nor the timid faith of the woman. Give healing and strength to the sick and suffering, especially on behalf of those named in our bulletin, including Caitlin Buckholtz and Jerry Meisner, and for all those we name in our hearts. We implore you, Gracious Lord, your compassion does not willingly afflict or grieve the children of men, but your mercies are new every morning. Bestow your steadfast love on every Christian home. Bless those celebrating birthdays and anniversaries this week, including Meredith Newman, Barb Miles, Pastor Keel, and Pastor and Caitlin Keel, that as they celebrate another year of life or marriage, you continue to watch over them, providing for all their needs and granting them joyful celebrations. Grant them another year of life for marriage to come. Heavenly Father, your Son used his divine powers as a man on earth to heal and save. We thank you that he continues to use his divine powers as a man, bodily present in this holy sacrament, to deliver his healing and saving power of faith. These and whatever else you would have asked of you, O God, grant us for the sake of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord and Savior, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forevermore. Amen. continue with the service of the sacrament. We stand before the Lord at his banquet feast, where Jesus Christ is both host and feast. In bread and wine, with forgiveness and grace, God heals troubled souls. Blessed are you, O Lord, God of our fathers, for you made all things and still preserve them. You sustain your creation even when we rebel against you, choosing the course of sin and death. You raised the prophets to proclaim your word, and you made your word flesh. By the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have forgiveness and life. Open our eyes to the miracle of his grace, and help us faithfully to receive him who comes to us now in this holy meal, according to his promise. Keep us in your promise as you teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, and now when he's betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them all, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is in the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. As do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The grace of our Savior be with you always.
We rise. Let us pray. O Lord, we witness with awe the power your Son manifested in healing the sick and raising the dead. With even greater majesty, you revealed your power by raising him and all believers with him to eternal life. Grant us courage to trust in him for the grace to heal and sustain our lives on earth and the confidence to believe in him for everlasting life and the resurrection to come. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord and Savior, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, our God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his everlasting grace. Amen. We'll remain standing for a closing hymn with the doxology verse, Lord of all good. Our sneeze was coming on. You may be seated. Okay, now you may stand back up again. No, I'm joking. <laughs> Get our morning exercise in, standing and sitting all the time, for, especially for all doxology verses. Again, a blessed morning to you all on this um, fifth Sunday after Pentecost. Thank you to everybody who prayed and shared and came and helped with the Feeding America, or what was Feeding America now, their food distribution with uh, Ministerial Association and the link. I didn't get the official numbers, but I think we served almost up to 300 people. It's a little lower than we normally see, but that's because it's changed a little bit. Now, the food that we gave out, we have on stock at the link. So if you know people who are still struggling to feed their families or themselves, you can send them to the link here in Newberry. You can send them to Marcy's Pantry in Curtis. Um, I'm trying to think, is there one in Ingadine? I don't know. I don't know what uh, Love, Inc. has down there. Um, but they can get in touch with whoever. But again, anyway, thank you, everybody. And uh, again, the same type of distribution is going to happen in the middle of July coming up. Um, and so if you can help with that one again. And again, if someone needs food, please send them to the link. They have a stock bounty of the same food, again, that we can keep helping uh, people out. Uh, let's see here. Next week is 4th of July weekend. And so the parades, as we do every year, however, uh, Newberry's parade is on Saturday morning at 10 o'clock, which I will be at Bethlehem at that time. So unless someone wants to either drive my big truck or haul a trailer, gooseneck trailer, with their vehicle if they have that set up, we will not be in uh, Newberry's parade. If you do or you want to, please come talk to me. <laughs> Otherwise, we will set up the float Saturday, late Saturday afternoon, 
uh, they get it ready for Sunday for at Curtis. And then if you want to ride, we're going to be on the big trailer parked over here, so anybody can ride. Our theme is Fishers of Men. So come in your fishing gear if you want to ride. And no one has to walk, and we've got a lot of goodies we're going to be throwing to the whole crowd at Curtis. So we are going to be in Curtis Parade on Sunday at 1230. And then we'll finish, we're going to finish decorating there at the parade because we don't want things to fly off the trailer going over there. So if you want to help us decorate beforehand, if you want to ride or not, we need that. And then again, if you want to ride to toss out things, we need some people to ride with us to be fishers of men. In a sense, we're sharing God's news as we go throughout the parade. So we look forward to doing it next week. And anybody wants to help, please get in touch with me or just come. We appreciate that. Uh, and then later on in July... We have um, July, let me get a look at the date, 19th. July 19th, we are actually going to have a voters meeting. Typically, we don't have one in July, but it's set up that we could have one, which we need to. Uh, some of the things to be discussed. One is we're going to be voting on our vacancy time, just our vacancy time. And that's possibly moving it to 1030. So Alan and I aren't always rushed to try to get here, especially come winter time. That's what we're more concerned about, is we know this vacancy is going to go into the fall and possibly winter. Um, and so it's just to ensure us that we're not getting too fast on the ice and snow out there and sure sometimes. So we said, why don't we just look at changing it now already? So that's going to be brought up. That will be official vote then. Another thing we're going to be looking at is just a preliminary vote about what Trinity wants to do with the Tri-Parish. I want to explain just a little bit, so bear with me here. What's going to happen is Bethlehem is going to have their voters meeting first. And everyone's going to do preliminary voting. So I talked to Pastor Randy about that, just to see a direction that each church wants to get into. For us, it's to see whether or not we want to pursue this. If it's leaning one way or the other, then we know. If it's split down the middle, well, then we need to have more discussions and look at more things. Um, but then Bethlehem is going to be making their vote based on um, whether they're going to stay Saturday morning or go back to Sunday morning. Okay? We will know that before all the other voter meetings. If they decide they don't want Saturday morning anymore after the vacancy and want to go back to Sunday morning and would like to, become, and would like to call me as a pastor with all the other three churches, then it will come down to all three churches have to meet together to pick a time on Sunday to fit for all three. <laughs> so yes, that means that we can vote to say, not this coming voters meeting, but down the road, official vote to say, yes, we want to make a tri-parish call to Pastor Keel with all three churches together. But that does mean, though, that we may have to switch our times again after the vacancy, just so everyone's aware of that. What that is, we don't know yet. No one is making an official vote on any service times in July. We're not doing any of that. We gotta first find out what Bethlehem wants, and then we gotta first a service Saturday or Sunday, and then we gotta find out what actually Bethlehem and Grace are doing. If both of them almost unanimously they would like to call me as their pastor, they will be sending letters to Trinity addressing that and asking um, officially to then work together to call me as a pastor for all three churches then. That is how the process is going right now. Um, in regard to the surveys from Pastor Randy, they are not done yet. They should be done about mid-end of July, and then he'll come up and talk to us about all three churches about the surveys. Um, and so that's why we're making no official vote yet. Um, what could happen is, depending on how everything goes next month, and then a few months after that, we technically all three churches could make official vote in October, and I could be the call pastor for all three churches by the beginning of next year. That's how quick that process can go. If that's not the way we're going, you can look at about a year and a half, two years of me being vacancy pastor for the other two churches, because that will take about it that long for them to get either a pastor from the seminary or a pastor from the field. So just... Uh, so, yeah, that's from the district that it could take that long because, again, we're looking at 72 vacancies in the state of Michigan, our district right now. So there's a lot of places that need to be filled, <laughs> a lot. And then uh, keep in mind also finances and other stuff as well. So a lot of this we're going to discuss at our upcoming voters meeting that continue proceeding forward, especially knowing getting stuff from the other two churches as well. If anybody has any questions or anything on that, please come talk to me um, so we know the direction that we need to go and make this all open. Again, that is a Monday night, 7 o'clock. The blood drive is that same day, too. And so come for the blood drive and then stay for the meeting afterwards. Um, and we'll have snacks or something out as well. Um, there's enough time in between the two to clean up and get everything says. We've done that in the past a few times already here. Um, but yeah, so, and then I think there's going to be some other stuff we'll probably have on the meeting. Um, maybe looking at the parking lot. 
Um, we'll get more updates on that, extending our parking lot back here. Um, we're trying to get quotes for that to get that done maybe this year so we have some extended parking over there. Um, I know some people are parking over there already, so we're getting used to a little bit. <laughs> Technically, if you want to, you can park all the way up here. You see the trailers are parked over there, nothing saying, so we're okay. <laughs> so if you want to park closer over here, by all means. Um, so it's great that some people are over there utilizing that. So we'll probably look at those as well and those some other stuff with the voters mean. But we're trying to make this as open communication as possible, what's happening, so everyone is on the same page and we don't get confusion about, well, they said this or I heard that or this or that. So everyone knows, okay, this is what's coming forward and what we're going to be voting on. And again, if you need clarification or questions on anything, you can come talk to me, you can call Pastor Randy, you can talk to Don or any of the elders as well, and we can update you with that. Okay, thank you for listening. With that, let's pray, and then we'll enjoy a time of fellowship hour and be on our ways. We pray, dear Father in heaven, thank you for blessing us with your grace through word and sacraments. We don't deserve it, but you freely give it to us through your love, through your Son. We thank you that he came poor for us to make us rich in all these great ways, that we leave here knowing that we have been uplifted and strengthened in our faith in all things. Now as we go on our ways, whether all out to whatever is happening or downstairs at Fellowship Hour, continue to bless us and be with us. And we enjoy this time together we have in service to each other and towards you, Lord. All this we pray in Jesus' name as we say the common table prayer. Come, Lord Jesus, be our guests, and let these gifts to us be blessed. All give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, his mercy endures forever. Amen. God bless you. Go in peace.